All right, I just restarted the recording. Let me just get a drink before uh, jumping back in. Let's see here. All right. So we did compound literals for struct unions and arrays. Um, we did function calls with this expected type inference stuff. Um, what is left on the menu? So we don't do floats right now, we don't do strings, and let's defer that. We do name, we don't do casts, we do call. We don't do index, so let's do index. We do field, we do compound, we do basic unary and binary, so we have to flesh out all of these. We don't do ternary, so let's do that. Um, okay, let's just start with ternary. I guess ternary would actually be a, a good um, a good case for expected types as well. Um, so you can propagate it down the two branches of the ternary. So let's provide that. Um, someone's asking, does the current code do constant folding? I thought you mentioned it at the beginning, but I didn't catch where it was being done. So. Uh, it does constant expression evaluation. Constant folding is actually, uh, normally when that term is used, it's used to refer to a backend optimization, which is kind of opportunistic. Um, a language like C and Ion actually has a explicit set of things that are allowed to be constant expressions. And that's really important because it's basically defines what can go on the, go in the size of an array, for example. Um, but yeah, so right now I just handle um, one case of it which is sort of a, intentionally, it's just one case because they're all basically the same. Um, but yeah, so right now we only support the addition operator and you can see the way it works is recursively resolves left and right. Uh, operands does type checking and right now it only does ints. And then if both left and right operands are constants, then we will actually do the constant expression evaluation right here. So, uh, but, but, but if either of them is a non-constant, then we can't, uh, do the evaluation and we just return a non-constant uh, R value. So that's the idea. Um, someone's asking, how long do you think it will take until we have a basic ion program compiling and running? Um, I'm hoping to get um, the, maybe on Friday, depending on how you mean by running. Um, I'm hoping to tomorrow start on the C backend uh, once this stuff, like I won't do everything for the resolver right now. Um, in particular, I've been looking at, don't I have this open? Um, I was looking at this stuff yesterday. I was looking at this, this is the C99, I guess it's the C11 draft, draft specification. And I was trying to remember exactly what C allows for constant expressions and what of it, which of it we wanted to support. Um, so the integer constant stuff we're going to have to support uh, more or less in the same form. Um, the stuff with address constants I'm probably going to leave out of version zero. So we are, we're already using address constants um, in this file actually. So an address constant is something like this. Um, the right hand side here is an address constant according to C. And this is obviously useful but it's definitely not essential for version zero. So Stuff like that, I'm probably going to leave out of version zero. So yeah, I was I was looking at this stuff yesterday, trying to figure out what's left for uh, like how much I have to handle in the resolver before I feel comfortable for version zero. So um, my goal is to try to 
between today and maybe part of tomorrow to get the resolver, uh, you know, which is basically everything except code generation to get that sorted out and then to start doing the C code generator pronto. Um, probably some part, sometime tomorrow start to do that. Um, we could actually do a shitty backend right now because the main thing we really need for that is to sort the declarations. Once you've sorted the declarations in an order that corresponds to what C will accept, um, you could actually do a crappy C code gen. Um, so we could we could start in the code gen right now. I just felt like it would be uh, moving ahead too quickly before uh, putting the resolve into a decent state. But um, if, if you think about what the like, let me show you what I'm what I mean in concrete terms. Um, if you take something, if you take something like this, I can't remember where the cutoff was. Okay, let's leave it like that. Um, Someone's asking if we will write a function to print floating point numbers. We will do that in the far future. Um, it's not that difficult to do inefficiently, but it's kind of a distraction. I, I, everything related to floating point, I was hoping to delay until we do floating point from scratch, which will mean we have to write a soft floating point library, implement a floating point F, uh, FPU and hardware. And all of that will be easier in some sense, uh, at least for a simple version than <laughs> some of the stuff involving careful rounding for printing. Printing is not too bad. Reading is a little bit harder, I guess, but especially doing it decently fast is pretty hard. So I don't want to get distracted with that uh, in the foreseeable future. So we're going to do some of that stuff eventually once we get to floating point in general. But for now, no, we're not doing that. All right, let me just um, stuff that out. Sean's asking about doing doubles in hardware. I mean, doing doubles in hardware isn't any harder than doing singles in hardware. It's just more hardware. I, I have actually been thinking about doing doubles with machine mode traps and falling back to soft floats. And actually, I, I plan for a first implementation of floats. I mean, I can talk about this since it's not the mainstream and I don't feel compelled to follow any logical train of thought now. But um, once we do floating point, my rough order of, of operations I plan to do is we're going to we're going to do a soft float library for uh, IEEE 754, um, and then so basically that will be a reference implementation. So it's not going to be particularly fast, but it's going to be sort of the reference style code for that. Um, then we will turn that into. I will show how to use that to implement soft floating point, not via soft. There, there's two ways of using software floating point. Um, there's the what most people call soft float, which is actually an ABI kind of thing where uh, all the code, all the machine code and stuff, all the compiler stuff, generated code is generated knowing that you're targeting a software library for floating point. And that's what most people mean by soft float. But actually another thing you can do is just um, trap on illegal instruction into machine mode trap handlers that uses uh, soft flows under the hood. And so for that case, um, there's a bunch of intermediate levels of support. But basically, you can imagine the floating point register file is actually stored in uh, SRAM. And when you do these various operations, they trap into uh, in, into software that runs in the firmware that does the work. And so I, I was thinking that would be a fun thing to do once we've written the, the floating point code, just to show that it can be done that way. Um, and then from that point, doing the HDL implementation. The HDL implementation will be parameterized in the basic size parameters, like you know, exponent width and, and mantissa size. And um, well, it'll be easy to do that in HDL because it's naturally parameterized. And all the IEEE 754 operations, uh, I guess, ex is that true? Maybe square root's a little bit different. But all the basic stuff is going to be naturally parametric. And so we'll do that. Uh, and, and it may end up in the final implementation that we choose to do doubles via the machine mode trap approach, just because uh, we, we need to support it in order to be risk five compliant, but I will not write code that really uses it. Like, I mean, even on computers where doubles are essentially full speed, I basically never use doubles. Uh, it's very rare that I find myself using them, but we do need them for uh, compliance. And if we have a soft float fallback, we can use it for uh, for, do, for doing the trap mode uh, emulation stuff. So.
yeah so float stuff is going to be fun uh i did some prototype work on that earlier this year and it was not as doing simple floating point hardware is actually not hard uh, as i learned uh not not very hard at all uh doing good good hardware for it is obviously much harder and i'm not sure how far we'll go down that road uh, one of the surprising things from doing the prototype implementation was that the code was actually cleaner in HDL code than in C code because you have, you know, you have arbitrary width bit vectors and arbitrary width bit bit bit, bit, bit vector math, and so some of it was actually quite a bit just more natural. Uh, you didn't have to think too hard about uh, how how wide the different fields are and stuff like that. Anyway, okay, where were we? Yeah, so I was going to try to connect to the C code gen from what we've already done. Um, my basic plan for doing C code gen for version zero is that, um, um, so C code gen template um, for declare all struct, struct unions um, uh, let's see, define const bars, const structs, unions, type devs, etc. in resolve complete order. Um, and so step one is basically to for yeah to for declare everything and this will be cleaned up eventually, but for now for declare everything, um, which means that all the structs and unions at, the, at this point are basically treated as incomplete types. And then we basically take the order we get out of the resolver, which is this thing here, and we generate corresponding C definitions in this order. Uh, and then finally, uh, for declare all functions, and then define functions in source order. Uh, so this is not uh, what you want to do eventually for having very natural C code, but this should actually work. The, the complicated case, um, I guess maybe this needs to be intermingled with some of this stuff if, you have a var that references the size of a function, so maybe um, so maybe I'll just say functions um, here up here. So this is probably fine. Um, so yeah, we would actually be able to do a pretty decent job of this right now, and the only thing. The thing that would be easy to skip if we wanted to get there ASAP would be the expected type stuff I just talked about for uh, compound literals. You know, you would have to propagate that information down to the code generator. But the rest of this stuff could be done by just traversing the AST based on the resolve order. Um, Yeah, something like this. So, so this kind of this is, this is probably going to be the code gen template we use for uh, for version zero. And the thing that's kind of nasty about this is there's all these needless for declarations, um, and it doesn't make any particular effort at reordering functions relative to each other in order to minimize the for declarations. That wouldn't be very hard to do, but the, the the only annoying thing about having to do that is it means we would have to descend into well, at least as we're doing it right now, it means we would have to descend into the function bodies during resolution rather than just do, waiting until the final pass after things have been ordered. And so since functions can always be forward declared for mutual recursion and stuff like that, or, or even just non-recursive out of order calls, um, this seems like the reasonable way to get started with this. Um, and so this is pretty unproblematic relative to what we have right now. But I don't want to just totally leave the resolver in a partial state if there's um, stuff that needs to be filled in. But ho hoping to get to to the C code gen on Friday at least. Um, so I hope to work on it on Friday. Whether I'll have worked on it before then is an open question. But um, so we, we should be able to get some very simple code on Friday, even if it's not every part of the language that's fully supported at that point. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, someone's asking, can you brute force accurate floating point operation using, say, 300-bit fixed point? Sure you can. Um, in fact, so Sean was just talking about sticky and guard bits. The 
the the the one pretty neat trick in floating point um and specifically for subtraction i guess there's the notion of a sticky bit where when you shift the smaller exponent operand uh to match you know when you when you're adding two things you shift the smaller up to match the larger so you align the exponent so you can just do the mantissa addition or subtraction um, as you do that you shift stuff you, you kind of shift a bunch of bits out to the right um, and there's something called the sticky bit which corresponds to you can think of it in two different ways it records whether any of the bits that have been shifted out are non-zero um, because it turns out that this matters for rounding um, because when you're trying to round when you're trying to do a perfect type if you're trying to do a perfect tiebreaker for rounding for the you know the 0.5 like you're perfectly in between the two nearest numbers in order to break the tie um, you need to know whether in the potentially arbitrarily long for not almost arbitrarily long tails of things that have been shifted out in order to do the exponent alignment you need to know whether there's something that's zero or non-zero because otherwise you don't know whether it's perfectly 0.5 or 0.5 and then you know some tiny bit down the line somewhere 100 bits down or whatever can it be 100 bits i get yeah it can be 100 bits so uh, the sticky bit kind of lets you not have it means you can do the perfect round to nearest stuff for the tie breaking um without needing 300 bits or whatever but yeah you can actually do it that way um you can do you can get exactly the floating point results by computing it with perfect uh you know you, you would have to the largest possible exponent difference number of mantissa bits beyond this, the initial mantissa bits. So if you have 23 mantissa bits and you have an exponent difference of whatever, I guess it's something like for single precision floats, it would be uh, almost 256, except for one of them is reserved for denormal, whatever. So it would be something like 23 plus 250 something. So yeah, it would be less than 300 bits, but then you could do it perfectly. And then you would do the, the, the rounding afterwards down to you know your normal single precision and uh, you would get the same result you would have gotten if you had done it with sticky bits, guard bits, and round bits. Um, but anyway, so you can do it that way. That becomes really impractical, by the way, for double precision. 300 bits is not uh, impractical, I guess, but uh, for double precision, the exponent range is uh, astronomical. I mean, you can still do it, but it's uh, it gets even more impractical there, even for a reference implementation. But uh, I actually thought about this. Like, if you have a language like Python with, um, you know, with arbitrary precision integers, it wouldn't. It, it might be a fun way to validate an implementation to just do, you know, like using bit at begins to do it perfectly without throwing away any information until the end when you do the rounding. But uh, but yeah. Excuse me. All right. So yeah, code gen. The only annoying thing about code gen is the, well, there's a few different cases. One is I still have to figure out what we're going to do for, for untyped, like for literal integers and con integer constant expressions. Um, so originally, and I, I'm still planning on doing basically the go style untyped so so here's the conundrum it's not very hard if you're if you control the entire pipeline yourself to do say big num or you know in go's case i think originally 256 bit um untyped literals and then once you know they're used in a narrower context like you assign them to an n16 or whatever you can first of validate validate that they're, that they're in range but you can also just do you know do the conversion there that's fine when you control the whole pipeline but if you're generating c code and you want the various constant expression stuff to not only you don't just want to generate the final result you could easily do all the constant expression evaluation with your big num library in your compiler and then just output the final constant directly in the c code but that would make the c and we that we may do that for version zero but that really ruins the any notion that this is idiomatic c code because it's almost like you've macro expanded all that stuff like it's it's almost like looking at macro expanded output at that point um, but the problem is if you try to represent you know each of the ast elements kind of isomorphically in the generated c code then there's some problems of how you could replicate um the sort of big num style untyped literals um 
So I'm I'm still hesitating on whether we should go a slightly different path for the untyped literals. Um, Yeah, so I'm still not sure about that. That that's one thing that I'm not sure about how we're going to handle for C code gen. But we can punt on it a little bit and just be sloppy and pretend everything is an int sixty or pretend everything is just like a normal int or whatever int sixty four un sixty four, um, and just be cognizant that it's not really correct for everything and uh, and do something better later. Or we could reevaluate uh, how I was planning on doing uh, constant literals. And I should also look at what Swift is doing because I think Swift also, you know, it's a C-like language. It also moved to um, moved away from the C style, uh, usual arithmetic conversions and default integral promotions and all this stuff. Um, so presumably they have a solution for cleanly working with literals and constant expressions without having to cast all over the place for simple arithmetic operations. So I should look at what they're doing and see if they have a better solution that would work for my case as well. But anyway, that's one case I'm worrying about a little bit. Um, the other stuff is, is I can see how to do it. So we should be able to do that this week. All right. Um, okay, that was, I forgot what I was wanting to do. Actually, I want to go to the bathroom and I'll be right back in a sec. And I will mute. All right, turn the audio back on. Let's see if someone says something. All right. Um, so yeah, let's go back to ternaries. I think that that's what I was um, working on. All right, um, ternaries. Ternaries, ternaries. All right. So, uh, so solved expression. Um,
Um, all right. So let's see, else expression. So we have to do constant. No, let's see. Is it worth doing? Do we need constant expression evaluation for this? I guess we do. Um, Um, this is a resolved L value. So right now, I mean, right now, we, our booleans will be very similar to C booleans. They won't be a true boolean type uh, in the C sense. Um, that's just uh, a, a choice to not deviate from C that I never found that problematic in C, um, but more to the point, right now in the actual resolver, we're not representing very many types, and so, uh, like right now, I don't even allow pointers, um, which I probably should. Okay, so let's bring some of the stuff back. That works. Um, let me just read this code though. So resolve the condition, check that it's an integer type or a pointer type. Um, resolve the two branches, make sure that um, In the other order. Let's make sure they have matching types. Um, if the condition is constant, then we can statically resolve like this. And otherwise, we just have, we just use, yeah, this one, which is the same as the else. Uh, okay. So um, let's do some warm up. Let's do int uh, var i equals. Uh, something like this. Um, right, so that worked, but maybe let's look at the entities. So if you look at i, it's been resolved, and I guess since we're using it in a var context, we don't retain the constness, but um, this, this would be a better example. Right, so it selected the two. If I made this zero. Select the three, which it did. Um, 
And if I made this something else like, gosh, I don't know. Um, let's do this. If I do this, sorry, there's a fly in my face. Really annoying. Uh, this should not work because it's a constant. Oh. What is it complaining about? It's digit C out of range for base. It's interesting. Oh, here. By the way, this error is like the most annoying error in C. Um, all right. So why is this not giving an error? Shouldn't it be validating? This is you. This is definitely not a constant, because I itself, even though it has a constant value here, it's a variable. It shouldn't be usable in this way in the constant context. That's a definite error. Um, okay. This. Fly or whatever it is is driving me nuts. <clears throat> so this is never getting called. Oh yeah, that's totally a bug. Right. And if we move back, What is going on? Oh, it's because I'm in the debugger. What? This is insane. Did it override my key binding to now be something totally different? I have no idea what that was. All right, so if we put it back to this, it should no longer error out. All right, um, so I think that's it for ternaries. And this will automatically handle, let's see. This is a little bit weird in that depending on whether the condition is a constant and you know it's true or false, the constantness of the overall expression will change because it's possible for the then expression to be constant and the else expression not to be. But uh, depending on whether this thing is one or the other, um, I mean, in some sense, this is the using the most information it can at compile time. Okay, this fly is going to die. Um, so maybe I'll leave it like this, but I don't even know if that le corresponds to legal C. Let me test that actually. So if I have in C, um, this an example of something you can only use, right? So say you have int A, um, you can obviously do this. Um, if I now do int i, and so this thing should never evaluate the this branch. Okay, this actually works. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> that's fine. 
has been crazy. Um, so this actually works. And then if I change this to one, does it now have a compile error? Yeah, that's interesting. So I wonder if this is actually just like a specific compiler behavior or something more than that. Let me test it on GCC. Okay, so that is allowed apparently. Okay, so it seems to do even more aggressive constant folding. This fly is seriously bugging me. All right, so this works, really? That makes no sense to me. Why is it allowing that? I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I guess I'm going to leave it as is since both GCC and MSVC seem to allow it, but I'm surprised that it allows some of this stuff. Like, what does that even mean? Yeah, baffled, frankly. Oh, VLA? That's a good point. I thought you needed some extra notation for VLA, but I guess not. What's... Um, Okay, there we go. But if this is like that. Okay, so that actually does work. So it, it actually completely ignores a branch that's ruled out by a constant condition. I guess not. I mean, it's confused. Okay, no, it doesn't allow that. All right, so I probably should make sure that we can't do that. Um, let's see here.
And so this is still fine, but if I now put this in here, even though that branch is totally eliminated uh, statically, um, that should still not be kosher. Right. Okay. Someone's asking, what does a resolved expert has have that a expert doesn't? Well. I mean, it doesn't have an expression at all, really. It's just the result of resolving something. So the primary thing is it has a type and also additional information about whether it's an L value or a constant. And if a constant, what is the constant value? So that's really the main point. So it actually doesn't have, I mean, at this point, it's divorced from the AST node. It doesn't actually know what AST node it came from. Um, Someone's asking, won't doing constant folding interfere with the desire to generate isomorphic C? So again, I don't want to call this constant folding. Constant folding is usually considered an optimization. Uh, it's something slightly different. The, the constant folding we're doing is absolutely required in order to evaluate uh, array sizes, for example. So it's not something you can choose to do. You absolutely have to do it. Now, in terms of generating isomorphic C, you can still do that. You just have to make sure you generate it based on the AST, not based on the flattened types and stuff like that. So the C generator will traverse the AST. It won't use all the flattened constants. It will follow the structure of the original AST. Um, but you absolutely, you can't get around it because you need to be able to know whether, uh, you know, you, you need to know whether, for example, if I type this uh, and I type um, this, you need to know in a statement, you know, well, let's see, maybe that's a bad example. But if, no, that's, I guess, I guess you can't do value assignments for these. What's a better example? But anyway, you need to make sure that when you have this sort of situation, like if you have a function, for example, or if you have any context where you need to know the size of, of an array, um, oh yeah, like an initializer. Um, if you have something like this, and you do this, in order to type check this, you need to know the size of the array. So you absolutely need to know this. It's not something you can optionally do. It's not an optimization. It has nothing to do with optimization. It's something you need to know in order to know what types are in the program. Um, so, but you, you know, for, for the code generation, for generating C code, you will still just walk the AST. All right. Um, let's see, so that was ternaries. What else is on the menu? Casts, not much point doing right now. Uh, let's do indexing, that's a good one. Um, resolve, expert, index. And let's see, so we have to I don't know what, what do you call that um, resolve okay let me think uh, I think one thing we haven't done we need to do let me just fill this in when we do a resolve expression name um, So we get an L value of that type, and that's right. Um, where do we do pointer decay is the question. So we need to decay arrays to pointers, and do we do that in, at this place, or do we do it, no, we don't want to do it here. We want to do it, I guess, well, let's just do pointers for now. Um, and then think about where the right place is to do decay. So uh, for index, let's go and look at this. Uh, for index, we have expert index. Um, 
probably be called something else. But let's leave that for now. Um, not array. It's called operand. Um, some of these names really need more effort put into them. So um, It's going to be an L value, and depending on whether it's a one or the other, we will do this. You know, there should probably be a helper function resolve with expected type. It's called expected. And this is the workhorse. And then there's a, because most cases don't have an expected type, so they shouldn't have to pass an all. That's really nasty. Um, All right, that's not the right thing. Um, what do we call it? Index. Index type. operant type
makes no sense. Oh, guess the prototypes are wrong. Solve expression and then resolve expected. I mean, I understand why this is the only one that's complaining. It's because the others are not using the Ford declared version, but. Did I really not define it? Place where I just verify that works without breaking existing stuff. Um, reasonable. The thing we were working on was index. So we solve the operand and the index. Check that the operand is either a type, uh, a pointer or an array. Check that the index is an int. Okay. And so now if you have, for example, that um, we have a bar i equals a say one plus let's just say one that seems to work let's verify that the inferred type is correct this was i and so r is a var and it has type int We should also be able to do stuff like, since it's an L value, we should be able to do this. Um, that type checks. And now if we do var i equals dref, well, we can definitely deref. We know that works. If I do this, this sh should be correct. That means I should have type int. Yep. <sighs> Uh, 
what someone's saying. So the point of resolved expert is to one, get the types of everything and two, do constant folding. Sure. Um, I mean, it's really, you can think of resolved expert as literally just being the return value of resolve expert. So whatever resolve expert needs to provide goes in there. And uh, because of that, I'm just adding to it as I run into new things it doesn't cover. So it's not just types, right? Like for example, whether something is an L value is actually not part of the type, um, right? Like that that is a feature of, yeah. That's that, that's not a type per se. It's an additional characteristic. So all that stuff would go in there. Um, all right. So that was indexing. What is next? So we now do call index field compound unary binary ternary. So, okay. So we have all these cases. Uh, let's maybe just do more of these unary and binaries because that's where a lot of the combinatorial explosion is of course um, Don't even know what you call this operator. Um, bunch of this should be factored out. So I think I accidentally checked in eval, which was part of some failed stuff. So I'm just going to delete this. Um, but that's kind of what we need to do. Um, so eval unary. Um, And I'm only going to use it for for ant. So actually in this case it's pretty trivial, I suppose. But it, I still I think it still makes sense to bring it into a function even so. Um, something like that. Um, Belt in unary takes an up and a vowel. Why does it say too few? Oh. Guess that's not part of the operand. It's dope.
Let's just test this. So it's going to be like you have this thing. <sighs> do plus i and minus i. Verify right, these things have the right types and values. So i is 42, which is what we declared it. This is plus 42, and this is minus 42. So that works. We should verify that um, if we change these to vars, this should still work, just not with the constant evaluation. So this should infer all the right types. This is int. Also an int. This is also an int, so that looks good. Um, let's do the same thing for binary. Let's see. Let's do them in some structured fashion. Um, add sub. Let's do high presidents first. So mall. Uh, div. I guess. Same thing for mod. Um, let's see, what else? L shift. R shift. What else do we have? Um, let's see here. Maldiv mod. And um, L shift R shift add sub XOR or looks good. Uh, comp or what is it called? Equal EQ. Um, and an or has to be probably handled specially because you, I don't think, let's see, you don't want, hmm, that's interesting. I think I'm going to do this until... Okay, so the thing I'm thinking about is if you have, um, suppose you have something like this, 
um, x or um, y uh, 0. Suppose you have this and it's a constant expression. Um, you cannot, if you if you do constant evaluation as part of resolve x for one of the problems is that you unconditionally do it in most cases, at least right now in my ternary, I do it unconditionally on both the branches, even if I know statically that only one of them may be relevant. Um, and so stuff like this will, it, it, with, the, with the code I had before, even though this will never evaluate this branch in like at runtime certainly, um, at compile time I would say divide by zero because it would evaluate it sort of greedily rather than lazily. Um, and the way I'm doing the constant evaluation right now is kind of makes it hard to avoid that unless I have some kind of unless I try to separate that a little bit more, which I don't want to do. So I think for now I'm just going to leave it like this and not complain about divide by zero and constant expressions. Um, I guess I didn't close. Let's see here. What did I mess up? Missing colon before. So where did I forget a semicolon? Presumably it's this thing, right? Yeah, someone's complaining about undefined behavior. I don't really care about that right now. Um, there's a lot of stuff. Like all of the constant stuff is not um, is not final. I just want to stub it in for this stuff. But right now I'm concerned about what missing semicolon or whatever it is I'm doing that makes people, or makes the compiler unhappy. Extra, ec oh, I see. This, this is from the old code. Thank you. Um, but yeah, maybe I should. Uh, yeah, there's undefined. But yeah, I guess I should at least put a note for myself. Um, all right. Um, And then for this stuff, it's basically, we can't handle all the operators this way. Um, so we're not gonna do that. For now, we're only gonna do ints, even though pointer arithmetic is also allowed, of course, but um, we'll just handle those cases. Um, and then, let's see, expert binary up. There's some cases we I think we wanna handle a little bit differently, like, Logical and an or, do we want to handle those differently? Let's not handle them differently for now. Let's just handle everything uniformly, even though that it's not going to be able to stay that way. Um,
did I call it expert? That's totally not what I wanted to call it. Um, let's see here. So, diff okay, so I'm passing the wrong thing. First the up, then the left and the right. Um, oh, of course, left vowel, right vowel. I'm not going to do a full test of all those operators um, for now, but uh, let, let's do some basic stuff like um, let's see, two times three plus or minus five. So that's what six minus five is one. That looks right. Um, multiply by two. It's two. And um, let's take ten twenty four divide it or one thousand divided by that yep uh, someone's asking oh yeah unary not that's a good point um, and also unary logical negation or what, what do we call it? Not the neg. I'm trying to remember what I call this stuff. Um, token. I thought, oh, maybe I forgot to add that to the lexer. So maybe I just didn't put that in ever. All right, we can put that in now. Um, I guess we also didn't do, yeah, we didn't do just straight up that. We have to go to the parser. Um, so add sub mall and So let's do this and let's do a 
that's a good one. That should be zero. And maybe this one. So what was B? B should be one, right? Yep, and this should be um, yeah, minus two. Right, right, because so yeah, so that makes sense. Okay, um, or we can do it even like this. Should, you know, this should be minus one, and actually we can we can even do this. <clears throat> Say like maybe this is more interesting. Okay, something like that. So that was thanks for catching that. Um, all right. Um, so I think that's it for basic binary. Obviously this needs revisiting. The biggest thing I have to think through, I mentioned it earlier, is I'm still pondering how I want to handle integer constants. Um, the fact that we want to target C actually is a pain in the butt here because it would be pretty easy to just do go style untyped literals with internal say 256 width or 256 bit or some wider, something that's wide enough to accommodate both signed and unsigned in 64s is basically the the minimum criterion that would be really easy to do internally and it would really cut down on um it would really cut down on cases because you don't have to handle whatever eight cases you know signed and unsigned eight sixteen thirty two sixty four bit integers you wouldn't have to handle those cases in the constant expression code you would just do everything with this untyped integer type and then once you actually create a concretely typed variable, you would then narrow narrow it to that. Um, but that's really hard to do, I think, if we want to target C code, unless we want to do all the folding on our side and never do a structural translation of the AST. Because you know, even if we did everything with 64-bit, we would have to commit to signed or unsigned. And if you end up in a context where you're comparing those two, you have the usual signed versus unsigned issues where if you translate to a wider width internally, you avoid that, but you can't get the C compiler to do that basically. So um, I'll have to think a little bit more about that. For now, I just want to um, not have to get stuck in that hole and um, continue fleshing some of this stuff out. Well, okay, let's just say the following. Actually, let's just handle this now since it's easy. Um, well, it's easy if I mean you can do anything you want. So, so the the question is whether you should detect it or just give it a behavior. Now I'll just leave it like that, honestly. So then I inherit. Essentially, I will end up inheriting the host, whatever the compiler, your the compile, whatever compiler, C compiler, the Iron compiler is compiled with. Undefined behavior will, will exist at the constant expression level, um, which is, I think, good enough for now. All right. Um, do all these cases match up? Let me remind myself what C requires here. Integer constant expression. I think those cases are definitely required for the constant expression evaluator. One thing I, it's not hard to handle, but one thing I'm planning on punting on completely is doing constant expression evaluation for floats. Like, in other words, I will detect that, I will check that if you have a float constant, 
declaration that the argument is is indeed a float uh, constant, but I won't. I mean, we, we could do it. I could do the equivalent of, of this stuff for floats, but we don't actually need to know it in our compiler because we only really care about the front end stuff, which is if if we don't want to support casting a constant float to an integer and using that as an array index, we don't need to actually know in our compiler the values of float, float, float constants, float constant expressions. So I may just punt on that, which is not a case I've ever seen anyone use. Like I've never seen anyone do this. Um, you know, this is legal C, but uh, it's not really any something anyone uses, I think. So I'm not sure if there is any value in supporting it. All right. Yeah, so Sean's saying, um, folding on the ion side might have problems if it's an integer that depends on e.g. size of size t. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, that's totally expected. If you go way back to, uh, this is a cryptic remark. So here I'm talking about some of the benefits of using C as an intermediate representation for bootstrapping. And you'll note that I say portable modular API. And specifically, the thing I had in mind is the front end, even our front end, not just the C front end, our front end needs to know certain things about the target platform. Um, but it's pretty easy to insert, for example, static asserts into the generated code that will validate that um, our assumptions are true. And um, in most cases, it will also not matter. I mean, I guess I'll have to think about whether that's really an issue. Because you, the static asserts, you, you kind of also don't want to make it needlessly unportable. Um, like 64-bit versus 32-bit. Like the problem fundamentally is that there is a there's a certain narrow sense if I if I type this anywhere in the code. Um, no, I think it's fine to just let that behavior through, but you're right. We, I mean, we do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we do need to know the target platform when we're validating it. Um, at, so it will handle basically it will it, our, our compiler will type check the things for, for whatever target it thinks it's it's targeting even if it goes through c it's going to validate that it that it, that things are coherent for that platform but it's not going to validate that if you then t retarget that c code say on the 32-bit platform and you were the ion compiler was was you had told the ion compiler that you were targeting you know x64 or whatever um the ion compiler when you recompile that c code on another platform it may not work the way you expect it but I think that's just part of the that's just part of the the deal, unfortunately. But it's not. I, I don't know if that's going to be a big practical issue. I don't think so. All right. Um, so I've explicitly decided not to handle address constants in version zero, but we do need to support pointer arithmetic at least, uh, even if we don't treat it as a constant expression for globals and stuff like that. Um, so I do wanna do wanna support that. Um, actually, we should handle cast as well, even if we don't do constant expression evaluation for float to const. All right, um, so let's handle that. The generated code is going to be portable, but the whole point is we need to, so I don't know if, uh, if I'm explaining this clearly, the reason we need to do constant folding in, in a way that could potentially depend on a size of of, of certain types that are target specific, is that we you cannot do type checking without that. So it's just not negotiable. It's really like if, if someone types this, um, if someone types this in their code or the equivalent in Ion, 
Like we really need to know that. There's no way around it. We really need to know what this means. Um, and when you generate the C code, it's going to say the same thing. It's not going to have, so, so again, it's not folding in. It's not, when it generates the C code, it's not going to do this. It's still going to write this, but it's, but it does have to make an assumption about what that means in the context of the ion compiler doing type checking, but the C code itself should be fine. It will still say size of void star. And if you compile it on a 32 bit platform, that will mean four. If it's a 64 bit platform, it will mean eight. So in that sense, it's not assuming anything about the, 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 the target, but it does need to know something in order to type check. Um, but it's not going to bake in those, it's not going to force you to bake in those sizes in the generated C code. So does that make sense? So we need to know, we need to know what the numbers are in order to do type checking, but we're not going to bake in the numbers in the generated C code. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right. <clears throat> okay, so for casts, we have to resolve the type. Um, I'm trying to remember, is this the right name here? So right, so there's a type we, which we have to resolve, and we have to check that this thing matches that type. Um, Um, if result type does not match type. No, that's fine. So let me just think about what, what what's the correct possibilities. Like we basically need some sort of allowable cast matrix. Um, for now, we don't have enough types to really make that very interesting. Um, I mean, I guess if, uh, um, if it's not equal to, well, let's see here. Let's just think about it before writing code. You can do any pointer to any pointer, any int to any pointer and pointer to pointer. And I guess let's ignore arrays because I still feel like I should handle the array to pointer decay in a unified location rather than passing it all the way down and handling it at the individual sites. Um, so let's just handle the pointer cases. So if destination type is pointer and result type is um, if this is not pointer and it's not int Um, I'm going to use shitty error messages as usual. Invalid cast to pointer type. Um, <clears throat> All right, so if we're casting to int, it's kind of the same. Um, I mean, I guess in both of these cases, we will ultimately just return and it's, and it's always going to be an R value. I'm just going to return it like this. This could probably be written better. Um, but let's just leave it like that for now. And then if we have, let's bring back, back our trusty vector type. So let's see what you can do. If you have int 42 and you have, uh, and you have um, this, then you can, well, let's just write like this. You can do this. 
That's totally valid. Looks like I, oh, do I not have, I don't even think I handle casts. Do I handle casts right now? Yeah, so I don't think I handle cast in the grammar. Um, so it's an operand. Parse, expert operand. Um, let's say equals token, um, token cast, or no, match keyword cast keyword. Do we even have one of those? We do not. Okay, so if we have a cast keyword, then we always expect an open paren Eventually, we're going to expect a close friend, and um, there's basically two cases. If we can match a colon, um, I think in, in either case we get a type at the end of this type spec. Um, if there is a colon, then we parse the type spec. Otherwise. Hmm, I guess there's actually two cases for casts. No, let's, let's not use colons. We, we can only, there's no colons. Um, Type an expert. No, oh, expert cast. Okay, popping the stack. So we write it like this. Okay, so we had written the pretty printer for it, which is nice. Just not the parser code or any of the other crap. So cast, okay, and that seemed to actually type check unless it was just spurious. So let's force it to fail. Um, say we have a vector. We now do this, that should not be allowed. Yep. Um, but this is allowed, but we can also um, we should be able to do this and then eventually go back. Let's see. Let's do something like this. non-existent name. Um, hmm. V, so I is here. Um, P is here. J. Okay, what, what name was did it say was non-existent? I should probably have checked that. So that was, oh, void. 
There's no void star. Let's put that in. Um, it's definitely a C stable. Um, and then we have to it's a placeholder, but it should be fine. Okay, so. That all seemed to work. We should verify that the types are what we want them to be in the debugger. Um, so let's see here. I should be an int. Yep. Um, P should be a void star. So it's a pointer to a pointer to void. J should be an int again. And then Q should be int pointer. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Let's see what else. Um, name, compound, literals, casts, field index, array index, unaries, binaries, we're pretty good. Ternary, we're good. Call, we're good. We have size of. Um, so what are we lacking, if anything? The only thing we're lacking are these. Um, which we can handle pretty easily if we don't want to do anything crazy. All right, let's do those. Um, let's just proliferate the type matrix. Yeah. Um, oh, we already have float. Uh, should call them val. Let's call them this. Actually, you know what we can do? Um, I think that works in C99. <clears throat> um, yeah, we needed jar. Okay. Let's just say resolved R value. 
type float. So we're not handling consts, const floats, but let's not worry about that. Um, and here we will say our value uh, pointer to char. And so we can't let's just move this up. We can't do, and let's see that we can't do it. You can't do this because it's not considered a const right now. Yeah. Um, but you can do a var. So this should, what are you doing, Visual Studio? It got into this word state again where my bindings are just totally out of whack. Okay, I think a key got stuck. So maybe I can blame my keyboard. Okay, so let's verify that that works. This is a float. Um, and then if we have a name, it should also work. Pointer to char. Okay, so what is left? Resolve expected. What is left? Int float stir name. Int float stir name cast compound. Let's reorder them, so cast, and then call. Index. Field. Compound. Unary, binary, ternary, size of. So that looks like everything in terms of the categories. Um, Maybe I'll take a quick few minute break, uh, get some a drink, and I'll, I'll stay on stream and, and see if anyone wants to talk on stuff. And then I'll, I will in the back of my brain, think about the next thing we should do. But that covers the major categories, even though in many areas, it's definitely not you know production quality or, or complete or anything. But I think it's good to just get those things covered. And then we can do a pass on them and see what needs work. But yeah, I mean, hopefully people can see that this stuff is, it, Someone was saying um, the other day that you know they were expecting a lot of complex code. Instead, it's just a bunch of code. And all I can say is simple compilers should be simple. And you know, I'm kind of happy of people's experiences that most of this code is fairly trivial and straightforward because that's what it should be. I think the only, so far, the only thing that took me a while to figure out was the whole order independent declarations and actually my first idea was 90 percent there i just needed the notion to combine it with the notion of c style incomplete types and that was um and that pretty much just worked then but uh, all of this stuff should actually be easy so if people's if people's observation is that it's kind of simple code uh, then i'm happy because that's what it should be All right, um, but you can see, I mean, we're we're starting to deal with, I mean, we, we're still not descending into functions and handling statements and stuff, but that part is actually the easy part. So maybe we'll, we will do that next. Um, that might be worth doing next. To, uh, to just go through functions and handle the statements and stuff because it's kind of a natural extension of those. I've got a drink.
I think for all the all the statement oriented stuff in functions, it's going to be really simple because the kind of additional stuff you would otherwise need is like you need to know whether something is an L value when it's on the left hand side of an assignment. But we already need to know that for unary DREF. Um, and we already compute that. The thing we don't do is we don't have local symbol tables. So that's maybe one thing to think about. Um, it's not going to be very hard. My, I mean, right now we're not using hash tables for anything, but the, 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 the approach I've used in the past for local symbol tables is that the top level symbol table is a hash map, and then um, local symbol tables are basically just stack shaped so that when you go into scopes, you push a marker to say this is where the scope begins, and then you push, you know, a symbol table entry as you encounter them, and then anytime you want to do a lookup, you traverse the stack from the top down to the bottom, and if you hit the bottom, then you go to the global symbol table. So there's sort of some separate structures for the local and global parts, and then anytime you exit a scope, you just move this, you just pop the stack until you hit the marker, which designates the beginning of the most recent scope, and. Uh, that way you're doing linear searches for local symbols, but that's there's always relatively few lo local symbols, and it's nice and linear and simple to maintain and easy to push and pop and stuff like that. And then only the global stuff is uses a, um, a hash table, and that's really where you care about scaling because you can you can easily have you know thousands of symbols in the global scope. Oh, someone says I got quieter. It's probably because I removed the microphone from the vicinity of my mouth. <clears throat> Alrighty. Um, yeah, maybe we'll do statements. Statements and functions. Let me just think about that for a sec while I look through here to see if there's any major stuff I need to fill in. I would like to figure out the good way to handle arrays. Um, the easiest way to handle arrays is to decay them to a pointer immediately when they're referenced by name. Um, but that makes it harder to do decent error messages. But I mean, we're not doing good error messages already. So maybe that's fine for now. But yeah, I was thinking that basically, um, Like if entity type is array, then we decay it. We should be able to remove um, the index case. We should be able to remove this stuff. Oh, not all control paths. Right, so we just do this now. Um, okay, let's think about that. So let's see if our old array indexing now works. Um, I 
that works. We should also be able to do this, just directly use it as a pointer. That works too. All right. So maybe that's the right thing to do. If, if, if Sean or anyone else who, who knows C well is listening, I mean, I'm sure many people know C well who's listening. Um, is there an issue with doing this where as soon as you reference an, an array in an expression context, you immediately decay it to a pointer? Is there a case where you need to kind of let it percolate and only kind of decay it proximate to say an, an operator like index or deref that needs it to, needs to treat it like a pointer? Or is it okay to do what I'm doing, which is immediately decay it when it's referenced by name? Uh, if, any, if anyone can think of a case that uh, forces different uh, that forces me to do things differently than this, uh, I would appreciate a uh, tip or an opinion. Right, size of, oh right, size of an and. Hmm, the size of is interesting. That's definitely a case where you can't do that. Maybe what I just do is I just write um, you know I just write something like this. I mean, I think the the other way to do it is just to factor out the decay. So I, I can take something that acts kind of idempotently, where if something is already a pointer, it doesn't do something. If it's an array, it decays it to it decays it to a base pointer, um, and then I can just kind of wrap that in the context where I need to do something. I don't want a special case size of. That seems weird, even though I probably could. Yeah, okay, I see, that's a good one. Size of is a good example. All right, <clears throat> so I, I shouldn't do that. Um, Okay, so let's make a helper function called pointer decay. Um, Um, so what was I doing? Point type putter, expression type, array, on something like this. Um, and what were the cases now? I guess it's like the unary function. Um, And uh, for the index, okay, let's see if that works. So that works. Then I'll verify that. Um,
that this does something reasonable. <clears throat> so n should be what? It should be uh, 12, and it is. Uh, and this should be 4. Oh, sorry, 8, because it's the pointer to the first element, right? Um, okay, that's probably reasonable. So just call that function when you need to decay something before checking that it's a pointer in a case where... But I guess I need to do that almost everywhere where I check something as a pointer. Let's see what else I'm missing. Hmm, is this going to get kind of like whack-a-mole. Let me think if there's a better way to do the decay, like better place to put it. Um, This feels a little bit whack-a-mole. But I guess, I guess C kind of does really treat the decay as yeah, something that happens um, sort of on demand in the specific sub-expression context where it's used rather than, yeah, all right. This is probably fine. Okay. So what was the next thing? Let me just see if there's anything else like that that I didn't handle properly. Um, maybe I'll, I'll push this code as well. Did I just insert a tab, mystery tab? Um, okay. Seems to compile and run cleanly. If I'm always doing it before if type is equal to, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, that's a potentially interesting idea, Sean. I will, yeah, I'll think about it in the back of my brain. Sometimes for these sorts of, of, of small kind of cleanup things or whatever, I, I feel like making decisions in the moment is often uh, a bad idea. So maybe I'll just kind of let it percolate until I, I feel I have a better idea in general. I, I don't think in the worst case it's going to get too bad anyway, to be honest. There's actually not that many expression functions. Like, you know, most of, most of the stuff is consolidated under things like binary and unary. So there's actually not that many cases, even if I do it manually. So maybe it's okay for now, and I'll, I'll think about it. Um, I don't want to call this inconst, actually. 
even though it, it is, but I'm not using that convention anywhere else with the int. So, so we had float consts. Let's not do that. So maybe I should do float consts. Hmm. Maybe that I shouldn't really delay that. Not very hard to do, but it's just one more. I feel like once I start doing float consts, I would like if I had a solution to the whole issue with integer constants. Um, because I really want to clean up that area of C if I'm going to do a C-like language and C compiler, C-like compiler. Like I could take the coward's way out and go back to <laughs> go back to C C's convention where you have whatever the the integer promotions and uh, arithmetic conversions and stuff and promoting it promoting everything to to int and except yeah that stuff is so nasty. Um, I don't know. All right, maybe I will punt on that for the, until I get a better idea and I will start doing functions. So let's do functions. Um, let's do functions. Or not. What else do I want to do? In C, I don't think that works. Let's see if this works in C. I don't think it does. I just thought of some weird edge case for the size of array pointer decay thing. Um, if I do the, if I do something like this, what happens here? So that does do pointer decay as well. Yeah, so this is a, a funky edge case. This doesn't work correctly right now. Um, like if I do, if I do this in my code, Does not behave like C. That will actually. That will. Actually, let's see. Oh, so that won't even work because they don't have matching types, which I guess makes sense. But that's another case where you need to do pointer decay. getting a little bit silly at the very least there should be like a top level there should probably be but then it's yeah I don't know this pointer decay thing is a little bit annoying 
Let's see if I get the right answer. Um, yeah, so I get eight for this case, just like C would. <clears throat> I should probably just read the spec to see if they have a clean way of specifying it in C. But, all right, what time is it? I need to get lunch soon as well. Maybe I'll just take a break actually. Yeah, almost four hours live. So I think I'll actually take a break and get some lunch and then I will ponder some of the stuff like the pointer decay while eating. And uh, I probably won't stream more today, honestly. It's already been very long. But I will hopefully hopefully find a better way of, of factoring out some of the pointer decay nonsense and uh, clean that up. And then I will start doing functions and maybe even code generation today, depending on how far I get. I might actually start doing the code generation at a very stub level early just in order to force myself to think through. Like one thing that's been in the back of my mind is... Um, some of the code generation is clearly going to need resolve types, um, even though it's C. Uh, and you know a lot of this uh, AST stuff could be done by a trivial translation. Um, but some things like the type inference for uh, compound literals actually needs to know the types. And so one thing I need to think about is maybe um, I feel like I really don't want to construct a, a, a parallel AST or uh, or to annotate the existing AST with all the types um, from the resolution. Ideally, I want to be able to do anything I need to do on the way down from the recursion of all these resolve functions. So once I've finished resolving an expression, I should be able to call into the code generation backend to with you know the resolve types and all this other stuff, and so it can do its thing at that point. Um, and that will follow the shape of the AST. It will basically be a post-order traversal of, of, from the code generator's point of view, it will be a post-order traversal of the AST. So it might make sense also before I do functions, since it's going to be closely related to that anyway, it might make sense to start stubbing in some of the code generator just to see how it's going to fit in in terms of the call, call order and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, I'll work on that the rest of the day. Um, but some of this code is still pretty, I mean, it's not very pretty and the error messages are trash, but we, we've covered a, a pretty large chunk now of the language for type checking, so that's pretty good. All right, thanks for hanging out. Um, I'll be back, I guess, not tomorrow, but the day after, which is Friday for me. And uh, I feel like we're getting, we're not in the home stretch. Like, getting a lot of this stuff right is going to take careful work, and uh, we'll, we'll need cleanup. But, you know, for people who are sort of worried we would never get past parsing, this is starting to get a little more real at least. So, uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out. I'll see you guys um, the next stream.